Well, good morning. Would you like to stand to your feet? We're about to begin. My name's Georgie, and I'm on one of the team here. And we just want to extend a massive warm welcome to all of you here in the room. And to all of you watching online, good morning. A massive welcome to you as well. We're so glad that you could join us. But if this is your first time here, or if it is your first time in a little while, or if you come all of the time, a massive welcome from all of us here. So we're going to be here for around 80 minutes. We're going to enter a time of sung worship in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to pray and then we'll start to sing our worship to God. And then in a little while later on, Pastor Richard is going to bring an awesome message in our current series. But let me read, first of all, I have faith. Let us read, first of all, just from Psalm 100. Let's just focus our minds on this and just prepare our hearts and just quieten our minds and our hearts for one second shout with joy to the lord all the earth worship the lord with gladness come before him singing with joy acknowledge that the lord is god he made us we are his we are his people the sheep of his pasture enter his gates with thanksgiving go into his courts with praise give thanks to him and praise his name for the lord is good his unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues from generation to generation do we all agree with that this morning amen amen let me just pray before we worship father god i thank you that we can come and gather together in your presence and our hearts are yours this morning and we say come and have your way as we lift your name and we worship you in spirit and in truth, in Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
love this new one like this. Worship you for who you are.
never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working That is who you are, Lord Jesus. You never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our miracle worker, our promise keeper, you make a way where there seems to be no way. And our response is simply a thank you and our worship, setting our hearts and our minds and our lives before you afresh this morning. Church, would you raise your hands? If you feel comfortable and feel that you want to respond in this way, would you raise your hands just as a sign of surrender this morning, saying, Jesus, I hand all of my stuff over to you afresh again today. And I say, Lord, would you make a way where there seems to be no way? You make streams in the desert. You send your flood, Lord God, into the wilderness to bring new life where there is death, God. Thank you, Jesus, that we can commit all of our worries and our concerns to you because you care for us, because you love us, because we are yours, because we are bought at a price. Jesus, we love you this morning. We say thank you. We say thank you for that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Lift your voices this morning, church. Don't stay silent. Even the rocks will cry out, the Bible says. We worship you, Lord. We worship you and we thank you for all that you have done and all that you are going to do in Jesus' name. Whatever it is you're facing this morning, church, let me tell you that God can make a way. When you feel that you're up against a big wall, when you're up against a dead end, God says, no, I will make a way, but will you commit that thing to me? Will you commit that thing to me? Thank you, Jesus, that you are moving in this place even now. Even now, God, we worship you. We worship you. We say, Lord, have your way. Have your way in us. Lord, we thank you for all you've done. And I've got some praise reports here that I'm just going to read out in this attitude of worship because our thanksgiving for what he has done is praise. It is worship. John Marshall wants to thank God because his chest and uh, lung infection has gone. His cold has gone after four weeks. He is healed. He is now fighting fit. And we thank God in Jesus' name. Lucia wanted to give a praise report for a miracle in her life. God has brought breakthrough. She is able to move her legs like she never has before. And she wants to give him praise and thanks. So we thank him in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I wonder, Heidi, if you could come quickly. You've got a very quick testimony of praise to give God while we're still in this attitude of worship. Thank you. I just want to encourage, um, it's just an encouragement really, um, just an answer to prayer, massive breakthrough of prayer for us as a family last week. And um, I just, it's been months and months of praying and worrying and throughout that period, I've just realized that, you know, it's futile to worry, but we do, we worry. But God is always working on our behalf and he hears us. And I just want to encourage those who are waiting for answers to prayer. There's still a lot of unanswered prayers for us um, in various ways, but don't give up praying. He's never tires, God never tires of hearing your voice and my voice. He loves it when we cry out to him. And I've, I've learned a couple of things just through this period of the past few months, that worry is futile and that God is working and he hears us and he knows us better than ourselves and he answers prayers. And it's in his, in his timing, not ours. So thank you. Thank you, Heidi. That's wonderful. And it's in this 
revelation and understanding that God answers prayer, that we bring our prayer requests before him. And you might have something that you're carrying today that you're just pleading with God to answer. And I just want to encourage you, give it over to him this morning afresh. You might have done it a hundred times. This might be the first time, but let me encourage you to hand that over to the Lord. And I've got a few prayer requests here. I'm going to quickly go through them because there are a few, but could we pray please in this moment of prayer now for Adrian Walbridge's mom. Her name is Barbara and she's had a massive stroke this week. Would you lift her up? She's in critical condition. She's got paralysis on her left side, limited speech, but we believe in a miracle working God, don't we church? So let's lift her up together. And can we also pray for George Holdsworth, um, Alex's brother. He's been assaulted playing football and his jaw's in a mess. It's been broken and smashed and he's in hospital getting that treated. Would we pray for him, please, for this emergency operation? And for Brenda Wright, she has a sarcoma in her abdomen. She's seen a specialist tomorrow. She's a lady of real faith. Can we come along with her and stand in faith and believe for her that God will do a miracle in her life? And for Terry Lloyd, he's a friend of Howard Powsey. He's lost his mum and there's a request for prayer for him and the funeral is on Friday. Can we lift him up too and all of the family? And for little Alicia Moynihan, she was rushed to A&E last night. She's got a severe case of tonsillitis, really, really poorly. Can we lift her and the family too? Yeah, and just Roger and Pat Lister, I know you're watching online. You've woken up not feeling too well this morning. Well, we're standing together as your church family. And we're praying for you as well. Church, don't just hear my voice. And also, if you have got a need, I'm not going to get people to gather around, but if you've got a need this morning, would you just lift your hands up, just almost as a sign of surrender this morning, and I'm going to pray over all of us. And can we all lift our voices and pray for these cards that are in my hand? God knows the details of each and every one. Let's lift our voices now. Father God, we bring all of these situations before you, and we say, Lord, you know. You know the details, the ins and outs of all of these situations, but you are able and we put our trust in you we take our hands off and we say Lord would you put your hands on in Jesus name would you take control would you minister healing to all that need healing would you bring breakthrough to those that need a breakthrough in their life in Jesus name come and have your way Lord God would you make streams in the desert would you flood your love and your healing and your life and your light into the wasteland God and the deep and darkest places in our lives Jesus We say, Lord, come. We give you full access in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, come and have your way in us, Lord God, so that we may share all that you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Church, it's good to come before him, isn't it? We may come feeling really quite heavy and weighed down, but we can leave this place feeling lighter. He lifts our burdens, the Bible says. We've just got to come to him and hand them over. So let's give the Lord a massive clap offering for all he's done, all he's doing amongst us. And can we give a massive thanks to the worship team as well for leading us so well. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing. You know, Jesus doesn't stop ministering to us just because the music stops or just because we take our seat. He's working in us this morning, and I'm so grateful. But now's the time for 60 seconds of chaos. Are you ready for our minute mingle? And it's going to start now. Why don't you turn around and say hello to one another?
Okay. That's our 60 seconds up. Now is the time to stop being friendly. Stop saying hello, stop chatting and come and just bring our attention back into the room. Are we ready? Thank you. Let's take our seats. Now, as we said at the start, we want to extend a massive welcome to you if it's your first time. And hopefully, if it is your first time today, you will have received one of these newcomer bags. If not, come and grab one of us at the end and we would love to give one of these to you. Just grab someone in a blue t-shirt and they will get one of these bags to you. But there's lots of goodies inside here and a few bits of information. A few bits of information inside there, but one of the things, and it's been a bit quiet of recent weeks, but is the Lakeside Pen. Can we hear it for the Lakeside Pen? Thank you, there we go. And the reason we give you the pen, not because it's just amazing, but because we also want you to fill in this I'm new here card. So do us a favor, if you've got one of these bags and it's your first time, and if you're happy to do so, fill this in so we can grab your details and we can send our newsletter to you if you give us permission and you can find out all that goes on in the life of the church, and then you don't have to rely on listening and remembering the notices every week in the service. You can also just click on, not even click on, scan the QR code on the back of the chairs. If you want to see more about what's going on, it'll take you to a page on our website, and you can fill your details in there as well. How many of you know that it's good to gather in a small group as well as in a big setting like this? It's how we get to know one another, isn't it? And we have some new life groups on our website. So if you want to head over to there when you get some free time later on today, maybe, you can have a scroll down and see all the life groups that are on offer. And it's a chance for you to connect on a smaller scale and get to know people a little bit more deeply. Because sometimes it's tricky on a Sunday, isn't it? But we believe that circles are better than rows. That's true, isn't it? Just a little heads up as well, that next Sunday morning is the Mad Dog 10K race. And as you'll know from previous weeks, won't you, Stephen, that some of the roads get closed and so it's quite tricky to get access. So if, you are, if you're on any of our teams or if you're wanting to attend here and get a seat, can I recommend that you just leave a little bit earlier? And that way you can navigate all the different road closures and stuff. And next Sunday evening, we have got our annual special AGM Vision Evening. So you're all invited to that. Everyone is super welcome. And Richard's going to be sharing some of his vision. Um, so that's 6 till 7.30 next Sunday night. We'd love to see you here. We're also going to take our offering at the end of the service in our final song. Now, there are lots of different ways that you can give. They should be coming up on the screen now. Um, if you'd like to give in person in the room, then the containers are going to be passed around during the last song, and there'll be opportunity for you to do that. But please, if you're a visitor, do not feel obliged to give. Um, we're just glad that you are here. I think that's everything. I'm looking at the boss. That's right. I think that's everything. Can we just pray before Pastor Richard comes and gives his message? Father, I thank you that your word is living, it's active, it's powerful, and more powerful than a double-edged sword, Lord God, and it cuts right through to the issues of our heart. And Lord, I thank you that you've placed a word into Pastor Richard that he's going to bring this morning. I pray you would anoint his mouth, his words, and I pray that we would have ears to hear what it is that you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, George. Thanks, Georgie, for leading us so well and for the team for leading us. Good morning. Good morning. Really is great to see you here this morning. Just before I come around, the message that I'm going to get into as we finish off this series we've been working through this month, we just want to give you just a little heads up over a new series that we're going to run throughout next month. So just take a look at the screens. about the power of our words. We're going to look at the, the, what it says about the taming the tongue, how the power in life and death is contained within the tongue and the words that we speak and uh, looking at some things like gossip. But we want to look at the positive things as well, like speaking the truth in love. How many of you have ever had the truth spoken to you, but it's not been spoken in love? <laughs> 
And so we want to look at that and then also look at how we can encourage it, one another. Thinking about the kind of culture that we really want to create, one that brings and breathes life into those around us. So that's a little heads up, a little teaser for what's going to be happening next week. But we're into the final week of this series that we've been working through over this month called The Life You've Always Wanted, where the key thought has been this, what if, what if we were to step out of the driving seats of our lives into the passenger seats and let Jesus come and take his place up behind the steering wheel of our lives? What might our lives look like if that was the case where he was the one who took over control over where we went, the speed at which we went, etc. What might that look like? Because for me, I believe that if we were to do that, we might begin to step into more of what we would like to, to be, the life that we've always dreamed of, that, as we've said in the title, the life you've always wanted. This life in all its fullness, to use Jesus' words, life in all its abundance. And if you've been here for any of them or for all of them, well, then you'll know that we've looked at a number of things that that would affect us in. First of all, we believe that we'd feel more spiritually alive because we'd be spending time with him to connect with him, to develop our walk, our relationship with him. So we'd feel spiritually alive. We'd be feeling relationally connected, that we wouldn't go through life on our own, but we'd be making sure that we've got other people around us who are there to help us and who were there to help as well. We'd be feeling more physically fit. Uh, because just like I said last week, we'd be looking after our bodies and doing everything that we can to honor God with the bodies that he's given us. But then the fourth area, and this is the one that we're going to spend the time that we've got this morning honing in on, is perhaps one of the touchiest subjects that you ever come across within church life. Because we're going to talk about money this morning, and in particular, how we can experience God's blessing over our finances and so if you're here for the first time, I don't know if you've picked a really good Sunday to come here, first of all, or a really bad one, because so often the church can get accused, can't it? Well, all they want is your money. Anyone ever heard that? Anyone ever said that? <laughs> Not as many hands going up, thankfully. But so often we can be accused for that. My, my heart this morning is that that is not what you will go away with, because the heart of what we're going to share, of what I want to share over these next few minutes, isn't about what you might think or uh, God or we want from you, but it's about what he wants and what we want for you, which is such a big difference in that we want you to receive God's blessing over your life, not just over your money, over your finances, but over every area of your life. This is what this whole series has been about, but the way that we do that, the way we handle our money is an area that is very closely linked in with that. There's no getting away from it. And let's be honest, there's nothing as close to our hearts, is there, than our wallets or our purses. And, you know, actually, it's, I think, I've, I was thinking back, I think it's coming up to about five years since I've given a talk of this uh, uh, magnitude with this, which is really crazy because the Bible has far more to say about money and possessions than it does any other topic, and I'll come on to that in a bit. You see, money, we spend vast amounts of our time earning it, and I guess we could say we spend vast amounts of our time spending it because people say that money talks. And if you're anything like ours, it does. It normally says goodbye. <laughs> our kids have come up with a new way to save their money. Do you know how that is? They spend ours. <laughs> and so money, we can either enjoy its presence or we can bemoan its absence. And whether we have a lot of it or whether we have a little, whether we hang on to it or whether we hold it, quite loosely, whether we like it or not, there's no getting away from the fact that money plays a vital role in all of our lives. And everyone said, amen. yes, amen. Now, I've discovered that there are two opposing systems operating in the world today. There is man's economy and there is God's economy. You see, Jesus taught us to, to love people and to use things. But sadly, so often what we see happening in the world around us is one of the complete reverse, where we use people and we love things. And as I said before, money can be a really touchy subject for, for many Christians because we often feel it's right to be taught on issues of things like holiness and sexual integrity and all of these things. But as soon as money is mentioned, it can begin to feel, or, or you, can, you can begin to feel a little bit hot under the collar. 
Yet it's just as important an issue as any of the others, and, and one that it's important to know what the scriptures say and teach about it, because there's no getting away from the fact that God is really interested in what we do with what we have. That was a really good place to say amen. God's really interested in what we do in that which we've been given. I said last week, I said that same thing when we spoke about the bodies that we've been given, that we're to use them for, for his glory. And the same is true when it comes to money and possessions. And his views on this subject are far more extensive and much more clearly explained than you might imagine or than you might actually like. Now, I know in the main, you are an incredibly generous church. You really are. And we really do thank you for that. And so it's good to be reminded of some of these fundamental foundational things for us. But maybe you're here today, you're exploring faith or you're new to faith. And so it'll be really good for you to hear something about what the Bible says on what is a really, really important issue. Because there's roughly 2,350 verses surrounding money within the Bible. Yet there's only around 500 or so on faith and prayer. And furthermore, Jesus himself spoke about it more than anything else. When you read through the Gospels and you look at the actual subject of the things that he spoke about surrounding money, finances, possessions. He spoke on this far more than he did anything else. Now, why was this so when he lived in a much simpler society than the one that we live in today, where they're not tempted with things like credit cards or buy now, pay later kind of offers? I think there are two reasons why that's the case. Number one, because again, just to reiterate, how we handle our money affects our relationship with him. And then number two, because I think he knew how much money and possessions were likely to become the major competitor for the lordship of our lives. That our attitude towards it is an indication of where our heart is towards God. Because if I read correctly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 there, where he says that no one can serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other or uh, despise the one and be devoted to the other. If I read that correctly, I think that he's telling us there that the main competitor for our devotion is money. And so learning how to handle it correctly in a way that honors God is really, really important. As someone put it, we'll either follow after gold or we'll follow after God, <laughs> which is a really challenging statement, isn't it? In other words, I think he's really asking us the question, will our wallets come before our worship or will our worship come before our wallets, which is a really, really powerful and challenging question, isn't it? Now, you might be thinking after that, now that intro, I really do wish I hadn't come this morning. <laughs> I hope that's not the case because my aim is not to bash anyone over their head with anything like that. That is not what we do. It's not how we do things here. But what I do want to do is try and teach on it in the time that I've got because it's really, really important. And as I do this, I want to try and give a really balanced viewpoint on it because there are differing views that you find within Christendom. If you go too far one day, you end up with a poverty or a stingy mentality. If you go too far the other way, you, ha you end up with this prosperity mentality. What I think it's really important to have, what we want, what we need is a biblical mentality, one which encompasses both faith and generosity at the same time, where we remember that money is indeed a great resource. We can't deny that, but it's not to become my primary source because that place is reserved for God and for him alone in our hearts because money affects a really large part of our lives, doesn't it? It's fair to say that a major cause of, of, of family breakups and bust-ups in our world today revolves around Money, and as Christians, you know, we're not exempt from that. Just because we've invited Jesus in doesn't mean that we don't have those problems because that's not the case. Because we're all just as immune to this, as, as uh, um, prone to this as, as anyone else, which is sad, isn't it, really? Because we do have the scriptures to teach us how to be better at it, which is what this series, this whole series has been all about where we're inviting Jesus to be the one who guides us and leads us because as we do that, as he comes and takes up his rightful place behind the steering wheel of our lives, he helps us develop good habits 
And as we practice those good habits on a regular basis, that, that we then begin hopefully to make better choices that better with uh, that, that end up with wise and, and, and better results for us. And as I said, that involves our money and how we handle it because our faith and our finances are so closely connected. You see, if you really want to know what's important to someone, just have a look at what they spend their money on. The same is true when we think about the time that we have. Just see how a person spends their time and you'll begin to get a clearer picture of what really are the important things, the valuable things in that person's life. Because as humans, let's be honest, we have a knack, don't we, to find the money or to find the time to do those things which matter most to us. Can anyone identify with that this morning? Because I'm, I'm getting hot under the collar now, thinking I'm the only one. Maybe I just need to speak to myself about this this morning. You see, the difficulty with it, all of this is that we don't like people interfering with these things or telling us what we should do with them and that can sometimes include God but as with every other area of our lives God wants us to be wise doesn't he with with our finances with our time with all these things and he wants us to use those things that he's given us in ways that are not only going to bless him and honor him but also ways in which we can invest them into kingdom service and as a result of that reach out into the lives of of other people. Jesus said in Luke 16 and verse 11, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? I think that's really powerful words, true riches, because that tells me there's something actually that's far greater, far more valuable than money and possessions alone, the material wealth alone, and that is the kingdom of God. And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? I think what he's saying here, again, just to reiterate, is that the way that we handle our money has a direct impact on the quality of our spiritual life. Now, we've been talking in this series about surrendering control of our lives over to Jesus. Not because he's a control freak, but because he knows how we can get the most out of this life that he's given to us, how we can enjoy it the most, how we can live in that place called abundance and fullness that he himself said that he came to give us and to know the freedom and the blessing that comes with that. And he's the one who ultimately knows how that can happen because he's the one who created us, the one who gave us breath in our lungs to begin with. You see, Jesus knew just how much of our lives would revolve around Money And what I believe he wants for us is to experience the joy of being a wise and a generous steward of his wealth. And I say his wealth for a reason because, and this is the starting point for everything that I'm going to be saying today, something that you always hear me say whenever I talk about there's going to be taking up our offerings uh, whenever I'm leading. And that is that we believe that everything we have is because it's come from him to begin with and it belongs to him. This is the starting point for us. Everything we have is because he's given it to us and it belongs to him. If you don't believe that, you're going to struggle with the things that I'm going to talk about this morning. But this is what we believe the scriptures teach us. This is what we believe here in this church, that it's not yours or mine. Ultimately, it's his And I'll say a little bit more on that in a little while. But you see, the Bible helps us in all of this. And and it reveals to us the parts that both God plays and the role that we have to play in all of this. Because God retains certain responsibilities and and expectations from, from his perspective, but he's also delegated other responsibilities to you and to me as well. So let me just touch on God's part for a moment, if I can. Because, as I said, this is the foundation upon which everything else rests. You know, the Bible, the scriptures contain over 250 names for God. But I think the name that best describes him when it comes to this area of money is this word, master. And it's really important to keep this in mind and view him as such. Because if you can, then that's a massive step, I think, to 
stepping into this life in all its fullness that Jesus said he wants us to experience. And there are four key words which I want to give you to begin with, which all tie in, all flow from this word, master. And they are these, ownership, control, provision, and allocation. Let me touch on the first one, ownership. As I said before, those of us who are Christians, those of us who've invited Jesus to become the Lord of our lives, the starting point for us, as I just said before, is that everything we have and everything we see all around us belongs to God. Psalm 24 and verse 1 tells us that the earth is the Lord's and everything, not just parts of it, some things, but everything in this world is, is his. Psalm 50 and verse 10, he says, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Shared last week as we were thinking about our physical bodies and how we honor God with those. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He says, you are not your own. and you've been bought at a price. So our bodies are, are his. And the same is true, I believe, when it comes to our money and our possessions. It's all his in the first place. And so recognizing this, understanding this is a key element in allowing Jesus to be the Lord of those things. Because until we acknowledge this and hand them over to him, then we're never really going to fully experience his blessing on our lives in this area. But this sets off something of a bit of an internal war within us, doesn't it? If we're being honest. Because material things do have our names upon them. And this can create a tension, which we have to give attention to then, isn't it? About who really determines where our money goes. Will, will I really use my financial and material things exactly how God wants me to. But when we do this, for me, I believe it changes everything because every spending decision now becomes a spiritual one. Stay with me on this because where instead of thinking to ourselves, how shall I spend this? We're now beginning to ask the question first of all beforehand, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Because I recognize that it's not mine but yours. Now, I'm not talking about, Lord, do I buy the country life or the, or the, the utterly butterly or those kind of things. I'm not, I'm not talking about those things. You know, we've got to go and buy food and, and all of that stuff. I'm, I'm not talking about those, those everyday kind of decisions. But when it comes to some of the bigger decisions, like I was talking last week about our bodies and, and, and what we do or the direction our lives take, this is where we need God's wisdom. And we need to know, God, am I making the wise choice, the wise decision? In this area. And so ownership then is a key word. It's not ours, it's his. Whose is it? It's <laughs> just seeing how many of you actually said that. <laughs> it's, it, it's his. A natural follow on this then becomes this second word, control, that we hand it over to him. That word pretty much speaks for itself, doesn't it? That we allow him to lead us. You see, because we now, if we think about the things we've looked at so far in the previous weeks, because we're now walking closer with him, we feel more connected with him and we're, we're relationally connected to others. We're, we're hearing his voice more clearly. We know his heart towards things. And there's that obedience that we're, we're stepping out in because of that. We're much more inclined to loosen our grip on the things that we have and adopt a much more open attitude or open-handed attitude towards things where where he's free to come and take things out but also to put things in I remember hearing someone teach on this years and years ago for me it just changed massively just how I began to view things and and, and try not to hold on to things because so often if we're honest we can we can almost have that clenched fist mentality can't we where we're thinking no one is getting hold of this and God if you want this you're gonna have to come and just wrench my fingers open in order to do that God might say I want you to bless that person with something or to come along and help them. It's like, well, I don't really want to do this, Lord. And he has to almost, you know, just, just force our hands open. And it's difficult to live like that because there's that constant tension that's taking place and that battle that's going on within your heart. I've learned that it's much better to live with an open-handed mentality. Because if everything I have is his anyway, well, then it's not mine to, to try and hang on to. 
And if my hands are open, it's much easier for him to then come in and take things out or take things from me and just hand them, distribute them out to others because it's his anyway. But it's also much easier for him to come and put things back in. Now, we love the second part more than the first part. Let's be honest. Let's call it for what it is. But when we learn to live like this, there's a, there's a freedom and there's a joy that, that comes where we see God not only using us to, to bless others, but where we can receive his blessing being poured back into our lives. Because how many of you know you can't outgive God? God is no man's debtor. And it's all his anyway. So we've really got nothing to worry about. So ownership, control, provision is another word which talks about one of his responsibilities. Philippians 4 verse 19 says that he'll supply all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And so we can trust him again because we're walking closer with him. We've seen him come through on his word, on the things that he's spoken as, uh, 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 to us about and where we're acting on those. We've seen him come through so we can trust him with this. And so we're saying, God, I'm, 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 I'm believing that you're going to provide for my needs in this area because the same God who gave manna to the children of Israel in the wilderness and the same God who fed 5,000 plus in reality 18, 20,000 plus people with just a little boy's packed lunch has promised to supply our needs as well and just as any good father wants to provide for his kids so too does God towards us because he knows what we need even before we even realize we know it ourselves and so he's the one who provides and then there's also the word allocation I think that comes from that in that he will allocate wealth and possessions to those whom he chooses and for you and me it's not for us to question that because he loves all of us the same but to some he'll give more than others parable of the the, the, the talents shows us that very clearly so four words ownership control provision and allocation all flow out from this word master which is his responsibility his role in all of that but then of course we have a part to play in it and I think the best word that describes our role is this word steward steward that God is the master and we you and I as his followers are stewards this is the relationship I believe the Bible teaches us that Jesus taught us that we have in this respect and you know the steward had great responsibility he was accountable to his master for all of his possessions and his affairs now as 21st century stewards which is what we are today we're also accountable to God for the way in which we spend that which he's entrusted to us and it's out of this understanding in recognizing again that everything we have is because he's given it to us in the first place that it's come from God that we therefore not only want to thank him for it, but the way we handle it, we have to be wise and do that in the best way possible, which, as I've said, is his way where we step out of the driving seat and let him come and take up his rightful place behind the wheel to guide us and lead us in this area, along with all the other areas of our lives. Because it's when we do this, when we honour him, when we do things his way, that we receive the blessing, his blessing upon that, which we have and that which we do and what he's looking for from us more than anything is simply I believe to be faithful with that which he's given to us now I've already shared a number of different words over these past three Sundays um, I've got one more word I want to add to this list and it's a word that, that, that does has have the potential to make people feel again a little bit uncomfortable Yet it's a word that is really liberating. And that's the word bring. Everyone say with me, bring. 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 Bring what you're thinking. Bring your tithe. I was originally going to use the word give. But when you think about it, you can't give what doesn't actually belong to you. All you can do is give it back or, or, or bring it back, isn't it? And here's, here's the big thought for today. That when God is in control of your finances, then God is truly in control. When God's in control of your finances, then God is truly in control. Let me say something really important at this juncture, okay? 
This is not a ploy to get you to give more money to the church. Makes no difference to me personally if you do that or not. The primary reason, as I said before, that I'm speaking on this is to help you discover more of, more of God in your life, number one, but more of the abundant blessings that I believe he wants to pour out on and into and through your life. It just so happens that the way in which we handle money is such a key area and a crucial area in unlocking that and helping that to happen. Because when we do this, as I've said, it's amazing how much joy and freedom this can bring into our lives. Now, as with all things in our Christian walk, this is all an issue of the heart, isn't it? Guard your heart, Proverbs 4 and verse 23 says, for out of it spring the issues of life, everything that takes place in life. It's all about the heart and the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. That's why Jesus came in the first place, isn't it? To, 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 to make himself known to us so that God can do a work in our hearts, make us aware, awaken us to the reality of his existence. And whereas religion works from the outside in, it will tell you, well, you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to, to earn God's approval. Christianity works from the inside out that Jesus takes a hold of your heart. You enter into this relationship with him and he begins to change you from the inside out. And as we begin to, to, to surrender our lives more and more to him, and what, right, what lies right at the very heart of this issue, this issue, I believe, is this word, trust. Do I trust God enough to meet my needs? Is God really able to provide for me and do the things that he said in his word he's able to do? This is the crux, isn't it, of it all? For me, let me just speak about me. The regular and consistent practice of giving or bringing my tithe is a demonstration that God is far more important to me than anything else and that he can and will do all these things that he says he can and will do. Now, contrary to what some sections of Christianity might teach, I believe personally, I know we as a leadership team, we as a movement, Ealing movement, believe in the principle and the practice of tithing, giving a portion, a percentage of our income to the local church. I don't believe for one minute it's just an Old Testament principle. As some people will say, the New Testament supports it just as much, especially as we consider how much God has done for us through the Lord Jesus in giving his life to us. If truth be known, a tenth, a tithe, is really the starting point. You look at the early believers, they, 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 they sold everything that they had and brought it to the feet of the apostles so that they could distribute it to just as they felt they needed to in order to make no one went without. And so that was really just a starting point because we're talking here about radical generosity. You see, not long after I became a Christian, it'll be 30 years next weekend to the Sunday. It'll actually be the 6th of February, 1994, but 6th of Feb, 2024. It'll be 30 years since I gave my life and my heart over to Jesus. And you know, I didn't start doing this straight away because I wasn't taught on this. First of all, I was a new Christian, a baby Christian. But soon after I began to get, uh, uh, I was taught on this, probably after about a year, for the last 29 years, I don't say this to brag, but for the last 29 years of my life, this is something I've consistently and faithfully done. And I can't even begin to tell you this morning the ways that I've seen God release and pour out blessing over my life and over our life as a family during that time. And I, I know many of you, here this morning could say the same. Have there been times when I could have done without bringing it or giving it? You bet your bottom dollar there could have been. I'd be lying if I said there hadn't been. But I know, and this is one of the principles, I know that my 90% with the blessing of God upon it is worth far more than the whole 100% without the blessing of God upon it. This is that God's economy, man's economy tension that we have. You see, for me and for us, it's not a case of we can't afford to give. For us, the truth is we can't afford not to give. Now, that, that's us. I can only speak for us and where we stand on this. And I'm only teaching you what I believe the Scriptures teaches on this. At the end of the day, you have to come to that place of understanding 
and, and revelation for yourself and to practice this yourself. We will never force this on people. We can only encourage you to consider doing this. The only requirement is if the, you choose to become a partner, then part of that covenant that we make between us, between us as the church and you as the person coming into partnership, is that you commit to, to, to giving regularly to support the ministry of the church. But this is one of the paradoxes of living this, this kingdom, this Christian life, isn't it? To the natural mind, it doesn't make sense. Because God's kingdom is an upside-down, topsy-turvy kind of kingdom where the last shall be first and the greatest have to first of all become the least. Some of these things don't make sense. The way to discovering life is actually by first of all losing it, by, by laying it down, by, by giving it up. But this is such an important part of living life as a follower of Jesus and honoring God with what you have. And I can remember when I first started doing it, I'd have friends who would ask me what I'm doing, giving money to the church. They just couldn't understand it. Now, it's not, as I said before, that God needs it. It's all his anyway. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's all his. Everything I have is his anyway. But it's the way of saying to him, God, I thank you for all that you've given to me. And I want you to know that I am putting you first in my life before anything else. And I believe that when you're trusting God with your money, then you're really trusting God. Amen. You still with me? Yeah. <laughs> I want to touch on a couple of things over these last few minutes. I want to try and keep it as simple as possible. I mean, there's so much you could say on this. Because I know a number of you will be aware of this already, but there may be some here who, who aren't. This, this is all new to you. And you've often wondered about it. Why is it we, we, we take up an offering and we pass the containers around? I almost said buckets. <laughs> they containers because they contain that which God has given <laughs> to us. Why do, why do we do this? It's important that we, we're educated in this and we're informed in this sense. One of the key passages is going back to the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Chapter 3, and a few verses that we find there, they'll come up on the screen. This is what the Lord says here through the prophet Malachi. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and not kept them. If you go through Israel's history, you'll see just that time and time again, how they'd follow God and then they'd turn away, and they'd follow God and they'd turn away. It's no different really to us at times, is it, if we've been honest with times where we're hot there's times where where we're cold and we can be full on and then we can be away from him he says ever since the time of your ancestors you've turned away from my decrees and not kept them return to me and i will return to you says the lord almighty but you ask how are we to return will me immortal rob god yet you rob me but you ask how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out how much blessing, pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. What is the tithe? The tithe is, very simply, 10% of your gross income that's set aside as being holy, in other words, exclusive, set apart to God. In its simplest form, that's what the tithe is. People say, can I do a tithe on gross or net? I always say, if you're applying for a mortgage and ask you how much you earn, what do you give them? Your gross or your net? So give them whichever one is the higher. So 10% of your gross income. And the way that it's given is to what's called the storehouse, which is the local church. That place where you get fed. Not an outside ministry like, like God Channel or, or Tear Fund, as good and as important as those ministries are. That's what's called an offering on top of that which is over and above your tithe, but the tithe is brought into the storehouse, which is your church. And so it's not a figure, but it's a percentage. 
The amount itself is secondary. That's why I think Jesus told that story of the, of the widow's mite in Mark 12, that the literal amount she gave, just two little copper coins, was nothing in comparison to what the others were putting in. But in reality, she actually gave way more because she gave everything that she had. It was more like a tip from others. But for her, this was a true sacrifice. And God takes the tithe seriously. In fact, I think he takes it very seriously. So seriously that when it doesn't happen, he says it's, it's akin to robbery. How do we rob you, they asked. And he replies in, in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're, you're robbing me. Notice that he doesn't say they're robbing the church, but him. They're robbing him. And robbery, as we know, is a serious offense, isn't it? Only murder and rape would perhaps be considered as worse crimes in our culture today. God takes it just as seriously today as he did back then. What is it they're robbing him of? What is it that we're robbing him of when we don't do this? Just three things quickly want to suggest to you before I finish. First of all is this. We're robbing him of what's rightfully his. When people take something from you that's not theirs... I can guarantee that you don't like it, do you? Hello? Talk to me. <laughs> you don't like it, do you? My brother used to take my clothes when we were growing up together. And then it, I'd go to put it on the next week and it got a curry stain down it. <laughs> it just slipped it back in the wardrobe without telling me. I didn't like it. And you know, God's no different that when we take things from him that isn't ours he doesn't like it now as I said before it's not because he needs the money he doesn't need anything in that respect it's because he wants to re-emphasize that it belongs to him so we're robbing him number one of what's rightfully his number two we're robbing him of the pleasure that he takes from our obedience which is what he wants more than anything else because it's that which blesses him the most because it's your obedience, it's my obedience that constitutes our, our worship. And it's this which releases his blessing over our lives, isn't it? You see, you can give to God and not truly worship. But I don't believe you can truly worship without wanting to give. Let me say that again. You can give to God and not truly worship. But you can't truly worship without wanting to give. And when we obey his word and when we bring our gifts as an act of worship, that pleases him. This was a lesson King Saul had to learn way back in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 15, with the Amalekites, where he should have waited for the prophet to come and he didn't. He took things into his own hands and he learned a really important lesson that stripped him eventually of his kingship before it got handed over to, to David, that to obey is better than sacrifice. And it's our obedience that releases God's blessing over our lives. And thirdly, this is where it really affects us, that we're robbing him of the joy of blessing us. You could say, I guess, in that sense, that we're robbing ourselves. You see, the truth is that God wants to pour out his blessing upon you. This is who he is. He's a good, good father. We sing that song. He wants to pour out his blessing upon you. That's why he says, test me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and what pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. For me, it's just a picture of this, this life in all its fullness that Jesus said he came to give us. He says, I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields won't cast their fruit. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land. The truth is that God wants to bless you. That's his nature. I'm glad I got at least one hallelujah with that. God wants to bless you. That's his nature. This is what he's like. And there are all kinds of blessings that he wants to give and pour out over and into your life and mine. But they're dependent upon our obedience to him. You see, the floodgates are there, using this language here. The floodgates were there to dam up the water. And so the water's flowing towards it, but it can't get through. And so what's happening is it's starting to back up as a result. But when the floodgates get opened, 
It causes all that water which was meant to get through to now be able to, to flow through to its designated destination. You can see the picture that we've got here, can't you? And I believe God has so much blessing that he wants to get through to you and me. But through our disobedience, the floodgates come down and the blessing can't get through. And it's not that he's not sending it to you. The problem is that it can't get to you because the floodgates have been closed. But through your obedience, those floodgates get opened up. And all that which has been stacked up beforehand will now be able to get through and make its way through to you. The problem with the people of Israel at this time was that they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And as we know, the promises of God were linked into the covenant that they made with him way back in Deuteronomy 21 verses 1 to 14, which was basically if they obeyed him, God would keep his promises. And a few thousand years on, it's no different for you and me today. It's through our obedience that the blessings come. And so here in these verses, the only place you'll find it in the scriptures, anywhere, God throws open the invitation to us and, he, and, and, and this challenge to his people by saying, test me. Test me. Prove me in this. See if I will not pour out so much blessing upon you. But as I said, it's all an issue of the heart. That's why I said when you're trusting God with your money, then you're truly trusting God. Because when God is in control of your finances, then God is truly in control. And now, as I said, as I'm looking to bring this into land, maybe the band can come back and join me as we get ready. I've not shared any of this. Again, I just want to reiterate this. I've not shared any of this because we want or need more of your money. I was really thinking, let's take the, the, the offering up before I've spoken on this. But we're just keeping with our normal practice because this isn't a ploy just to, ag you to uh, ask you to dig that little bit deeper this morning or, or go online. That's not why I'm saying this. I've shared it because it's all about what we want for you and what you yourselves, I'm sure, desire is more of God's blessing over your life. Who would want to turn that down if you've got the choice living without God's blessing or with God's blessing? I know which one wins for me every single time, but there are things attached to that in order for that to happen. It just so happens that money is one of those key areas through which that takes place. And it all happens when we get out of the driving seat and we allow God to come and be the one behind the wheel to guide us and lead us and direct us in these things. So, so how do you take this forward? Because I believe with all of my heart, and you've heard me say this many times, that God's word is not only true, but he's always true to his word. Always. Always true to his word. And so I want to ask you this morning to just seriously consider the things that I've shared. Not just today about finance, but over the past four Sundays. And for you to seek God on, on, on how you are to respond. I've got some questions I'm going to throw up on the screen for you to think about. And with this, I'll, I'll finish. Number one, search the scriptures for yourself. Read all this for yourself. Don't just take my word for it because I'm up here on the platform and I'm pastor. Don't just take my word for it. Be like the Bereans. They were commended for going away and searching the scriptures themselves. See if this isn't true. If it doesn't marry up with what you think I or any of us say, please come and talk to us. Okay, we're only ever going to try and teach truth from this, from this platform. So search the scriptures for yourself. Read this for yourself. Number two, if you want to chat through this more, this whole area of finance specifically, please come and do that. Chat to me, chat to one of the team. You can have a chat with Clive, our treasurer. Any of us on the leadership team, you can do this. Number three, in this area of finance, I want to encourage you to, to take God at his word. And if you're not already doing this, to test him in it. Take him at his word. Test him in this. Consider tithing for the next 90 days, the next three months. And just see if during that time, God will not pour out blessing over your life. That doesn't mean that you give so much, he's going to give you way more back. Blessing is far more than just finance. It could be health, it could be relationships, it could be career, it could be a whole number of different things. But God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. 
And I know many of you who do this can testify to this. I, I, I could sit down and you could have here story after story of how God has proven himself faithful because you've been doing this, that you've been following this practice through your life. Number four, this is just a practical thing. If you're a UK taxpayer, do you know what? You can make your giving go even further at no additional expense to you just by gift aiding it. And at the moment, the, the government give us 25% back for every pound. So every pound that gets given gift aided, we get an extra 25 pence back on that. And that just takes that, that giving even further. And that makes such a massive difference to the finance of the church. And so if you don't do that, consider doing that. And we've got a person, John Croucher, who looks after that for us. But then thinking beyond giving, a, couple, a few more things. Number one, just consider your next step on your journey of faith. What's the next step God's calling you into? Maybe it's to be baptized. Maybe it's to consider becoming a partner. Maybe it's to connect in with a team, to become part of one of our serving teams. Maybe to sign up to a life group or commit to a daily Bible plan to grow closer to him. Could be a whole number of things. But what's your next step that God is calling you to take to go deeper with him? Number six is this. Do do something. Because when you choose Jesus, you're choosing life. And so all I, all I can honestly say is don't be half-hearted. If you're going to follow him, be, be whole-hearted. Choose this day whom you will serve. If you're going for him, go all in. Don't have one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world. Let's, let's be a people who are all in. Because having one foot in both camps, let me tell you now, it doesn't work. I've been there, I've tried it. It doesn't work. It's all or nothing. We believe Jesus not only makes life better, but he makes you better at life. Choose, choose Jesus. What's your next step? I wonder if we can just bow our heads. I'm going to pray over us generally in a moment. Susanna and the team are going to lead us in a song. But maybe you're here this morning. We do this every week. I just want to give you an opportunity to make that first step, the most important decision, which is inviting Jesus to become your Lord, surrendering your, your life and your heart over to him. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you want to make this prayer your own, just say amen wherever you are, quietly. And I'm going to ask you to put your hand up just to let me know. And one of the team is going to hand you something, a little gift to help you make some next steps. But Father, just, just pray this with me. Heavenly Father, thank you today that you love me. And that your desire is to bless me. And I recognize there's things I don't understand. But I know that I've not been living for you. And today I want to invite you, Jesus, to be my Lord and my Savior. And so I'm asking you to come and live in me. Take up residence in my heart and lead me and guide me into this life that you've come to give me. I turn away from all the things I've done wrong and today I choose to make you my Lord. And as you gave your life up for me, today I'm giving my life back to you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I ask this in your wonderful name. Amen. 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 Just keep your eyes closed, your heads bowed. Is anyone here this morning, just as I look around the room, and you've prayed that for the first time. If that's you, would you do something for me? Would you just pop your hand up quickly so I can see that? Just looking around, just put it high just so I can see that if you've made that. Those of you online, drop a comment in the chat or contact us this week on the website. Last chance, just looking around in case I've missed anyone. Okay. Heavenly Father, we want to know your blessing across every area of our lives and we recognize that money is one of those areas that are key in this and so we ask you to help us to honor you and to and to truly trust you in this lord you, you know how it can have such a, a pull within our hearts but we don't want to have anything that comes before you and so today afresh we surrender our hearts over to you and we ask that as we conclude this series, that we truly would get out of the driving seat and let you 
have your rightful place in our hearts throughout this year and that we'll see more of that life in all its fullness that you've come to make available to us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the sacrifice that you've made on our part. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Suzanne and the team are going to lead us. There's going to be teas and coffees being served upstairs. We're going to take up our offering uh, as we normally do. So if you've come prepared to give physically for that as the containers get passed around, uh, just pop that in there. But let's, uh, let's enjoy some fellowship afterwards. Have a great week. God bless you. from you. Lord, as we go through our week, help us to see where we can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen.